Thanks, Alexander. Good morning, everyone, and uh, good evening for those of you who may be straggling over from uh, earlier sessions. My name is John Stegman. Uh, people call me Steggy sometimes or Stegosaurus, which was my nickname as a child. But I was thinking, uh, as I was telling a, a colleague on an earlier session, the first programming language that I used in a, in a commercial setting, in other words, I got paid to write code was Fortran. So you could probably just call me an old dinosaur and it would fit right in. Uh, so hello, everybody. My uh, talk today is going to be to talk about what's new in Neo4j 5 and Aura 5, specifically focused on developers. Now, if you are more of an administrator, you'd like to find out about things like clustering and Neo4j Ops Manager. My colleague Stu presented yesterday at a session uh, Neo4j 5 for administrators, so you can always go back and re-watch that presentation. We're going to move along at a pretty good clip. I've got a lot of material here to go over. and. Uh, you, uh, those of you who see the chat, that's a great place to ask questions. Some colleagues are here answering questions, and I'll be looking over there to see uh, uh, what we can see in questions as we go. So just in, in broad brushstrokes, to give you an idea, uh, kind of the direction that we are taking the product in. You can, I'm not going to read through everything here, but the things in bold are things that I want to cover. And I want to focus specifically, as I said, on the on the developer community, the practitioner, the people who are putting their fingers on the keyboard and writing applications and uh, developing analytics with the database. So what does that mean? We're going to talk about support, talk about performance, scale, and security in broad brushstrokes. So let's dive right on in. So supportability. <clears throat> let's talk first about our, our prior model of how we rolled out changes to Neo4j. And in the release four days, we use what was called a branch model. You know, we'd start if we release 4.0, and then we'd maybe make some incremental bug fixes or security patches uh, to that 401, 402. You've seen this before in the software world. Then we'd come out with a 4.1 and a 4.2, and eventually we'd have, you know, a long-term support. We'd, we'd stop releasing those new versions and then just release patches uh, to that. And... Uh, the new model is really going to be more like what you would expect from a cloud first vendor or a vendor that that releases software in a continuous fashion and in fact that is this is always what we've done with our aura product which was a a uh, which is our cloud uh, uh cloud deployed database that you can sign up for and that is we continuously are releasing new features over time. And you can think of there's a 5.1 and a 5.2 and a 5.3, et cetera. But those features are coming uh, more or less on a continuous basis over time. So what's changing in Neo4j 5 is we're bringing that experience to the, uh, the what we would call self-hosted uh, community, people who are running Neo4j in their own data center or are self-managing their own deployments uh, on the cloud vendors. And what this means, there's really a couple of, of key things that this means for you as a developer. Number one is new features are now going to come on a much more regular basis. So rather than waiting uh, potentially six months between uh, a point release like 5.1 to 5.2, those releases are going to come about once a month. So you'll have the capability to uh, to take on new features as you see fit. Of course, we're not going to force you to do this, but you'll be able the ability to take on new features on a much more regular basis. Uh, but also a, a more, I think, more interesting uh, thing that we're doing is rather than making you upgrade, let's say you're on release 5.1 today and you stay on that for six months. And so now release 5.7 is the current release. In the past, what we would have done is we would have asked you to upgrade from, from 5.1 to 5.2 to 5.3, et cetera. You needed to do six upgrades to get to release 5.7. However, today with release five, you're going to be able to upgrade or migrate from any version of Neo4j 5 to any other version as long as you're moving forward in time. 
So you can't move backwards, go from 5.7 to 5.1, for example. But if you're on 5.1 today, and then six months from now, you want to be on 5.7, you'd be able to do a single upgrade from 5.1 to 5.7 without having to go through that intermediate steps. And you know, those of you who've been around for a few years, like I have, know that in, in organizations, especially large enterprises, uh, upgrades can be a painful process. There's a lot of vetting that needs to happen and so forth. So this this change, while it seems like it may be fairly minor, it, in my view, it's a pretty big change in terms of how people are going to be able to take advantage of Neo 4 J5 in a in a corporate uh, in a corporate environment. So in short, <clears throat> continuous releases about once a month, new features will come out and any to any upgrades. And the other thing that uh, I think this enables, uh, maybe I mentioned it on the previous slide, is that it will allow companies to go from a self-hosted environment to a or a DB environment because those, in, those uh, environments could be pretty close in sync, right? Rather than uh, having to do you know a chain of upgrades before a migration into Aura. Right. Just a few things to mention about things that have been removed. I'm not going to go through everything on the list here. You can uh, you can certainly go over this and see some changes. There's also a uh, uh, some breaking changes that we call, and, and I would say the most significant one is that we no longer run on Java 11. We're now running on Java 17. <clears throat> Excuse me. So those of you who are on uh, Neo for J4, or perhaps an earlier release, have a look here. You can always go online and read the documentation and find out some of the more uh, details here. If you see me looking over in the corner there, I'm just monitoring the clock to make sure we can get through everything. All right, so let's take a look more specifically about some of the about some of the features. We talked about the, the upgrade life cycle. Let's talk about uh, the tools that support the database. In the release for Realm, we have three primary tools that we publish for using with interacting with the database. First one is called Bloom. It's used for visualizing and uh, visually interacting with the nodes and the relationships between them in the database. We have Browser, which is a query tool that lets you write Cypher queries, see those results visually or in a tabular format. And then we have the Data Importer. <coughs> Excuse me which allows you to take data from, from uh, delimited files and import that into your database in kind of a visual, uh, graphically designed way. Now, we still have all three of these tools uh, going forward. Today, if you are using Aura, you have the ability to use a new experience. The same three tools, the three same three fundamental ways of interacting with the database, uh, just with a slightly different name. This experience we're calling Workspace. And Workspace is available for AuraDB today in what we would call a preview or, or beta mode. And I'll explain why it's in beta in just a moment. But what it does is rather than uh, force you to go to three separate tools to interact with the database, you can now go to one tool that's called Workspace. Everything lives under one roof. From a practical perspective, what does that mean to you? Well, first, uh, it, it removes a little bit of friction because you no longer have to sign in to a different tool each time. You just have to sign in once and then you can navigate freely. But in my experience, the thing that I like about it is that it lets you work with those tools uh, in, in a more fluid fashion without doing a context switch in your brain. So you know, I'm in Bloom, I found something interesting, or you know what, I need to go over and run some Cypher queries, so I better go log into desktop, for example. So this gives you all of those tools under one single user interface. And you can see on the top, you see Explore, Query, and Import. So Explore is what you think of as Bloom, Query is what you think of as Desktop, and Import is obviously what you think of as the data importer. Now, why is it in beta? Uh, the primary reason it's in beta is that the query tab, the one in the middle here, it's not quite feature parity yet with browser. So as we continue to uh, finalize that polish and get the, the features up to date, that will come out of beta and be available as the primary experience. 
So if you'd like to use this today, uh, I'm not going to go into the Aura console, but the way you would use it, go into the Aura console. Up over in the upper right, you see your profile uh, link, a little circle with your picture in it if you've logged on with Google or otherwise just a, a link with your initials. Pull that down and there'll be a little box at the bottom that says switch to the new experience. And that new experience is Workspace. If you do use that, be sure to click on the feedback link, give us some feedback, let you know what you, let us know what you like, what you don't like, and uh, and go from there. So Workspace. Let's talk a little bit about the changes from some of the drivers. Um, first couple of changes that I'm going to talk about are specific to uh, the Python driver. Um, the first one is uh, we now give you a very quick, simple uh, one line of code ability to take a result set from the Python driver and expose that as a pandas data frame. Those of you who are data scientists or who work with Jupyter Notebooks all the time uh, will know that pandas data frames are a really, really common way of working with uh, with data in Python. We now give you a really simple and straightforward way to do that. Little code example here, you can see the next to last line of code in there. Just take uh, the result from the query and convert it to a data frame. It's a really simple and straightforward. The second change in the Python driver that I'm gonna highlight is adding support for the async IO functions. Uh, again, we're just aligning it with uh, uh, with what the rest of the drivers that we have do in terms of providing this. This was a really popular request, by the way, a lot of upvotes on GitHub to add this in. And <clears throat> again, without going through the code here, you can see down at the bottom the ability to uh, uh, use this in an async uh, with async IO. Now, all of the drivers uh, have added this capability. And when you get an error back from the driver, something has happened on the database. Uh, syntax error in your query or something else, maybe a transient problem, we now have a flag that you can interrogate on the error object to indicate this is what we would do if you are using the automatic transaction management that the driver provides. Would we retry this or would we not retry this? So in case you're trying to uh, interact with that in a more fine-grained manner and maybe roll your own transaction management or you know, implement a custom retry strategy, we now give you, we expose what we would do if we were, uh, uh, we were uh, going to re retry that or not retry it on our own. Thanks, Richard. I noticed in the chat you've uh, referenced a, an upcoming uh, presentation uh, about the Python driver or about Python if you'd like to find out more. And again, an example, it's just a flag that you can query. Now, my colleague, uh, Andy, is going to be presenting uh, in a few hours here uh, 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 about some changes that are coming. OK, so what I'm going to show you here in the next couple of slides is not something that's there today, but I want to give you an idea of where we're going with, uh, with the, uh, the drivers in general and some new capability or new way of interacting with, with the drivers. And I could use an analogy here, and, and I'll tell you my personal experience as well with, with the drivers as I learned them. Uh, if you think about you know, the two types of cars, you know, I'm an American here, so we would we call it a stick shift and, a, and, a, and a, an automatic shift or you know, manual transmission, automatic transmission. The drivers today are really like a manual transmission, to use an analogy. And that is you have very fine-grained control uh, and power to decide when you're going to shift that, uh, when you're going to shift that, you know, in, in, with the drivers, you have very fine grained control of how you use bookmarks and, uh, you know, and how you interact with the, with the database in general. Now, my personal experience in coming to the drivers was that there is, for a lot of people, a pretty big learning curve when trying to use our database drivers uh, today. And I'll tell you why. Remember, I said I'm an old dinosaur. So I learned Java back, uh, gosh, when it was when it was first coming out, I remember uh, writing code in Java 1.2. And a lot of things have changed since then. So my mind is still kind of back in the in the dark ages of programming. And when I came to uh, 
use the drivers in Java for Neo4j. I had to learn, you know, arrow functions and Lambda and asynchronous uh, I.O. patterns to interact with that driver. So there was a big learning curve for me in learning uh, how to use the drivers because not only did I need to learn our driver API, which is, to be honest, fairly simple, I also needed to learn a bunch of other programming paradigms that I wasn't particularly used to. Now, if you're younger and more recent experience, that may not be an issue for, for you, but it was certainly for me. So what are we doing uh, is we're giving people that automatic transmission way of interacting with the driver. So rather than need to deal with all of those underlying details, uh, we give you a very simple way of uh, getting a session and then executing the query against that session and getting the results back without having to learn all of that, uh, that other, those other techniques that go with the language that uh, you may have otherwise had to learn. <clears throat> So if you've taken the class on Graph Academy uh, on uh, programming in your particular language, you know, we've got five drivers that we support. I was, I was doing the Java one at first because that was my most familiar language. Uh, you'll find that this is much easier and more straightforward way of interacting with the database from a programming language. So this is coming. Uh, our intent is to have a, a beta release of these drivers out shortly uh, within a few weeks. Uh, so that's not a promise, but it, as you know, uh, with engineering, sometimes timelines change, but that's generally the kind of direction we're going in. Okay, <clears throat> monitoring the questions. It's a pretty quiet audience. Uh, jump over to the chat if you have questions, uh, jump right in. So let's talk a little bit about changes to the Cypher language and some other things that are happening inside of uh, you know, how you uh, use Cypher or use APOC, which is our uh, a set of procedures within the database. So a couple of things that I would say are syntactical uh, improvements. This one in particular is actually comes with the performance improvements. So if you think about uh, doing a query where you're trying to uh, find find a node in the database that could be one of uh, several labels you know to use a, a simple example if you think of the movie database that we've had we those of you who've used the movie database uh, that we provide as an example know that we have a person node but you also know that those nodes might be able to have other labels like an actor or a director or a reviewer um, this new syntax allows you to bring that uh, disjunction or that, that, sorry, that conjunction where you say uh, it could be an actor, it could be a person, it could be a director, you know, any of these labels is a new syntax that you can see on the left for being able to do that. And not only is it a new syntax, there's also a new operator in the query planner that makes that more uh, performant. Another, this is more syntactical, it's not uh, necessarily a performance improvement, but the, uh, where you, uh, this is syntax where you can able, be, you are able to take uh, predicates or conditions that apply to a relationship and move them right into the, the relationship part of your match query, as opposed to doing a match query and then adding a where clause at the end. To me, this is, this is really nice because it kind of, matches how my mind thinks about queries. And that is, uh, like I'm trying to match this node, the relationship here, and I want to uh, qualify that relationship in some way. And again, here you can see an example. Uh, I'm trying to match uh, two nodes where uh, we've got a relationship between them and the protocol is HTTP within a certain port range. Now you can do this in release four. Obviously you just match uh, the relationship, and then you have where clauses for the protocol and the port number. This brings it all in line uh, to that. More expressive, I think, in some ways, less verbose. Uh, just kind of brings that together in a more concise way. <clears throat> and then finally, another syntactical thing along the same lines is uh, 
uh, label expression. So not just disjunctions where you say uh, or, but you can also do negations, nots. You can do conjunctions with ands and you know groupings and and so forth. Again, syntactical sugar, if you will, but again, making the language more concise and easy to uh, express. While we're uh, here, let me, we have a question, you know, workspace is good. Can we uh, enterprise non or have workspace future? That's the plan. Uh, right now it's uh, out there for or users. The plan is in the future, you'll be able to access it uh, even for self-managed. So just to summarize some of the syntax changes here, uh, on the left side, you see syntax from V4. You can still use the syntax, by the way, we're not deprecating the uh, the existing syntax, but on the right side, you could see how you might express the same query using the new syntax. And I think you'll agree with me, it's much, it's much more concise uh, and probably easier to read and easier to understand at a glance. A couple of uh, uh, other things in there, you see some breaking changes uh, and you see the traversal API on the left side. The traversal API uh, is an API that we had removed. We reintroduced that back into the product. So if you have used that in the past, we're disappointed that we've removed it. We've now reintroduced it. Uh, we haven't made dramatic change to that. Uh, we've just gone through a, a code review to make sure that you know it's, it's secure, it's performant, etc. We've kind of brought that into uh, into the uh, the database as a first class citizen that we've committed to uh, supporting. Uh, as I say, no real new features and no plans to add new features at this time, but we've brought that back uh, in. You know, you see in the middle of breaking change around privileges. Uh, this was. Uh, I think probably just a uh, 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 an issue where you know having an executed boosted privilege was forcing you to have another privilege even though you, you weren't explicitly granted that. So now uh, you can see we made that change there, and then finally uh, on the on the far right, some of the uh, uh, semantic errors were being incorrectly reported as a syntax error. So now we've we've kind of fixed that and. Uh, uh, portray that error in the in the appropriate in the appropriate way. So if you're using any of those or relying on any of the behavior in V4, just be aware that there's some changes uh, in V5 that will change how you do that. <clears throat> this to me is a big one, and and uh, there's been uh, to be fair a little bit of confusion on the community about this uh, to date. People who've downloaded V5 and said, "What's happened to APOC? I can't find APOC anymore." Well, what we've done is we've taken uh, uh, two parts, the two parts of APOC. We've had APOC core and we've had APOC extended. And what we've done is we've taken APOC core, this group of procedures, and brought it into the product itself. And it's being supported by the Neo4j engineering team. Uh, we're not going to be making uh, changes to that other than you know, fixing fixing major bugs or fixing security issues. But we but we've brought that in. We've committed to supporting that as a company. So if you're using APOC core, uh, you can you can rely that those APOC core procedures will work and that the uh, any security exposures will be rectified. The remaining part of the APOC library, what we've called APOC uh, extended is going to continue to be a community supported uh, project. It's not something that uh, we will uh, support officially uh, with the engineering team, but it will continue to live uh, in the uh, in the extended repository. Uh, and you can see as well one of the one of the other changes that the APOC core library will be supported in Aura. There's a few exceptions in there. And I'm not going to go to the link here. You could see a link if, if you'd like to download the slides after the presentation, you'll be able to follow that link and find out uh, which of the procedures would not be supported uh, there. Stu, thanks for the comment there. It still ships in the, uh, in, in the labs directory, but fully supported as part of the database. Okay. 
We're doing okay on time. Let's talk about performance. Now we have this concept, you know, called a, a K-hop query that you may have heard. And to me, uh, what K-hop queries is is basically a query where you start from a node, you make a number of hops, K of them, and you're trying to find uh, you're trying to find that n node within a specific a specific range. In version four, we would attempt to solve those kinds of queries or plan those kinds of queries doing what we would call a, a depth first uh, type of traversal of the graph. In other words, we would go as deep as we can in order to find the answer. In release five, we have a new uh, query planner method called breadth first to be able to prune that. Now, why is that so important? Well, it's important from a performance perspective. The for specific types of queries, and I'm going to give you some examples in just a moment. This can be dramatically faster than uh, than the old method of of uh, applying these kinds of or, or, or executing sorry these kinds of queries. And as I say, it can be pretty dramatic in our internal testing. Depending on how big K is, you could see anywhere from a two times to a, you know hundred times or more kind of a speed up as especially as that query chain gets longer. So without you needing to do anything other than to ensure that your queries follow these patterns for this kind of a query, uh, you don't need to do anything to take advantage of this. It's something that's built into the query planner and will happen automatically. Basically, uh, if you look at the queries here, you can see the, the relationship part of the query. They are all uh, multiple hops, so it's not a single hop. You need to start from zero or one, and you need to have an endpoint or uh, a maximum number of hops in that query. I tested this the other day with uh, someone on the community. Uh, uh, our community forums had asked a question where they didn't have a limit, but there was a there was a, a, a practical limit. So I tried it with one to a thousand, and as long as there's a limit there, we can use this new query planning uh, uh, or this new query uh, step in the in the plan. So you could see here, you need to start from zero or one. Uh, as long as you do that and you have a limit and you're interested in the endpoints, right? You're not so much interested in the path, but you're interested in uh, where you get to along those hops, this query planning method will uh, will take effect. And I can see the question over here on the right hand side. If you're interested in the path uh, today, this, uh, this new operator is not going to take effect. Um, you could see this uh, quite simply by profiling uh, the query in question to see if it's used and you'll quite if the thing to look for is that bfs in the uh in the query plan that would indicate that we're using this new operator right. let's talk about indexing because we've made a significant change in uh, the in indexing in release five and you'll see the 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 first one it's kind of the headline here we've deprecated or taken out B-tree indexes. So V5 no longer supports B-tree indexes. And we've replaced that with range indexes and point indexes. And you can see range indexes, you know, equals, greater than, less than, starts with those kinds of, uh, those kinds of query operations are supported by the range index. And point indexes you can think of, I like to think of them as spatial, you know, distance, uh, you know, multi-dimensional X, Y, Z coordinate kinds of indexes. Now, if you're using uh, V4 and wanting to move to V5, you're going to need to pre-create range indexes and point indexes to, that will replace your B-tree indexes. So as long as you create those indexes in V4 before you do the upgrade to V5, that upgrade process will automatically drop the B the B tree indexes for you. If you don't have those, uh, gosh, to re re refresh my memory here, I believe that upgrade will actually stop and tell you, hey, you need to do this before uh, you move on to the upgrade to V5. Uh, so what does this mean? 
it's a change. It's I would call it a breaking change. If you're in V4, you'll need to pre-create some new indexes before you move to V5. But going forward, those range and point indexes become the, uh, uh, the supported way for indexing. And you can see also some uh, changes to the full text index where we now support lists and arrays uh, in terms of the values that we index as opposed to just uh, uh, a scalar text and some performance improvements as well. Okay, last topic is security. And some of you may think, okay, why are you talking about impersonation here? I'm a developer. Um, well, in my experience, developers sometimes write uh, scripts that, that uh, you might run on a regular basis. Uh, what the, the capability that we brought into Cypher Shell, which is our command line uh, query tool that lets you run queries or runs scripts, as long as you have the appropriate permissions as a user. And here we can see we're logging in as the Neo4j user. And in this example, a Neo4j user has been given the appropriate RBAC permissions to impersonate another user, Stu. You can do that right here. Uh, uh, when logging into Cypher Show and impersonate that user. So you don't need to know Stu's password to impersonate Stu and run the uh, query or run the, uh, the script as Stu. You need to know your own password and have the uh, permission to impersonate. With that, I think we've got one minute left. Um, question, Rick, how do you choose between range and point indexes? I think it, it to me it's it's a relatively straightforward uh, question because you know point indexes tend to be uh, fairly obvious. I think when you're looking at multi-dimensional uh, types of things that you're indexing. So if you have an x and a y coordinate, or latitude and a longitude, or or three uh, you know x y z coordinates, those tend to point me towards a point index, uh, whereas range indexes would be everyone else at, and if. Stu or anybody else in the uh, uh, on the chat has any further on that, but to me it's a it's a fairly binary decision, unless I'm missing something of the uh, of the question. <laughs> 